Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, for an opportunity to get into your word, Lord, to draw closer to you, Father, through the scriptures, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us what you'd have for us this morning, Lord, and reveal to us your truth and how you want to relate to us. And just, uh, Father, you are such a great and awesome and loving God, Lord. Uh, we, we don't deserve what you've given us, Father, but we thank you. We pray, Father, that you go before this message, that you'd anoint my words, Father. I know you want to speak to your people, Father, and you're allowing me to be used, Father. So I pray that you go before it, Father, that you would speak to all of us, including myself, Lord, through this study, Lord. I thank you for what you're about to do. Pray, Father, that you would just uh, send out your spirit, Father, just to reveal to us what you'd have for us this morning, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's been a while since I've taught uh, on a Sunday, and usually when I'm teaching, I'm going through the book of Colossians. So uh, I want to remind you of kind of what's going on in the book of Colossians. What happened is Paul, on his third missionary journey, was going around, and he stayed a long time in Ephesus, uh, over two years and he shared, and it says that in Acts 19.10, that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So some of the people that had gone to Ephesus and heard this message from Paul, they had taken it back to their hometowns and shared it with the people there. And so the letter to the Colossian church is written to a group of believers that had started out this way. See, Paul had never been to Colossae. He'd never been there. And at the time that this letter is written, Paul is in jail. So the people heard the message through someone that got it from Paul. So Paul, in a way, is responsible for them. So Paul, who's in jail, most likely chained between two guards, gets a, a visitor. His name's Epaphras. And he comes to Paul and he says, I have some problems. I have a body of believers that started up and there's some things that have come up. There's some questions. There's some people that are saying, we don't have it right. We're, we're not doing it correctly. And so uh, I, I need help. What, how do I address this situation? So Epaphras goes and he visits. It's a long trip to get to where he's at. Um. See, they had a group of believers, and he was sharing the word with them, Epaphras was, but Paul's in jail for doing the exact same thing, for sharing the word, for sharing the scriptures. So that would be an encouragement to Paul, that it's still going out, the word of God is still getting out there. The message of this Savior is still being passed around. But from what I can tell from the time that Paul was in Ephesus, to the time that this letter's written. It's been about four to eight years. I mean, we've been coming to this church, a lot of us, longer than four to eight years. So they're a fairly new body of believers. So Epaphras himself could have been a very new believer, maybe 10 years. But we know he didn't have all the answers to the problems, and that's why he goes to Paul. See, these guys in Colossae had all these people coming against him and saying there was something else they had to do that they didn't have it right. And one of the things that they had said was that they needed to be circumcised. See, Jesus... Hold on, it says, back in his town of Colossae, there were people who said that in order to believe in Jesus, that they had to be circumcised. But... The law was given to Moses. Others said they, the believers there was a God. Others said they believed there was a God. But Jesus, even though he came from God, was not God, but a very distant emanation. And God and only they had the answers and could explain the deeper understandings. Still, there were others who were also giving their two cents and just causing a lot of confusion for this fairly new church. See, the main two groups were the Judaizers and the Gnostics. And what these groups were saying sounded good, but went against the word of God and the teachings of Jesus. So it caused confusion in the church. See, is the gift of salvation really free, or do I have to do something to earn it? It makes sense that I would have to earn God's approval. 
See, we spend our whole lives doing something to earn something else, to get a paycheck. We have a motto that says nothing in life is free. So is there something I can do to earn God's approval? The Jews have been offering God sacrifices for centuries. So are the Judaizers right that I need to offer God something? What about the Gnostics? They say no one can know God unless they have been given a deeper understanding, which only they have. That Jesus is not God himself in a physical body. That Jesus is not perfect. How can a perfect God make a sinful world? They said that no one understands God except for a select few, and they had the answers. The believers were surrounded by these different ideas. I don't know what it is. I don't know that it is possible to know a God as amazing as ours. So maybe they are right. Maybe they have the answers. So Epaphras, not knowing how to confront these groups, he goes and he gets the help from Paul. See, we've already pointed out that these groups, during the last study, Paul was addressing, and he started pointing out just how wrong the Gnostic way of thinking was. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, it says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now I'm still learning what it means that in Christ all the Godhead exists. And I know just a little bit more than I knew last time. But this mystery they claim to be the only ones who knew. Paul says it's all explained in Jesus. In Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. You want to know about God? Look to Jesus. Not to these Gnostics. We are complete in Christ. And there's nothing more to add. Now Colossians 1 verse 26 through 27 says, The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, you don't need some enlightened person to point you to the spiritual path. All you need is Jesus Christ. The other group that Paul is addressing are the Judaizers. They are Jews just like Paul, but they said it's not enough to simply believe. You need to keep the traditions, follow the law, become like they are in order to be saved. There is more for you to do, and there are people today who say the same thing. They may not be Jews, but they have the same line of thinking. You believe in Jesus, that's great. But you also need to, and you can fill in the blank. See, there's a word that is used in church or among Christians, and it's called legalism. And it simply means to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. You're adding something to it. It emphasizes a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth. See, legalists believe you need to believe in Jesus and keep the Old Testament laws. But in the book of James, we are told in chapter 2, verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all of it. Just one point. See, not only does legalism put the believer back under bondage, but legalism goes against grace. The Judaizers wanted the new believers in Christ to be circumcised, to be baptized into Judaism, and to keep the sacrificial laws just like they were doing. Paul confronts this line of thinking as we continue in Colossians. But last time we were in Colossians chapter 2, I finished up in verse 15. But I want to pick it up back a little ways in verse 11. So if you're not already there, just turn back to chapter 2, verse 11. In 11 through 14 it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sin of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Back in verse 11, it said, In him you were circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sin of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. See, in response to the need to be circumcised, Paul would say, When Jesus found you, you were dead in uncircumcision of your flesh. And he's made you alive. He's forgiven you all of your trespasses, wiped out the law, taken it out of the way, and you are already circumcised. See, circumcision was something the, Jew male, the Jewish males did as a sign to show their obedience to the covenant God made with Abraham. It was an outward sign that they were set apart as God's people. Romans 2.25 talks about how a Jewish man can be circumcised and yet not keep the law of God. And it would be just as if he never was circumcised because it was a sign that they were set apart as his people. But if they were simply doing it as a tradition, but their hearts weren't in obeying God, then why do it? See, physical circumcision as a sign of Israel's covenant with God, but this circumcision that every believer has, that Paul is talking about, is a circumcision of the heart. It's not a sign to say, I am a descendant of Abraham, but that they were set apart to love God fully, inside and out. See, circumcision means to cut around. True, children of Abraham are those who follow Abraham's example of believing God, faith in God. Genesis 15.6 is where you'd get that story. See, physical circumcision does not make a person a child of God. Faith does. Believers in Jesus Christ can truly say that they are children of Father Abraham because they believe God just like Abraham did. We are circumcised not with the same circumcision that Abraham's descendants followed, but the circumcision that all of Christ's followers have, the cutting away of the flesh around our hearts so we can give it to him. See, this circumcision is not something that we do ourselves, but that Jesus does in us. So do you have to be physically circumcised to follow Jesus? No. But as a follower of Christ, you will be circumcised by him as he begins to cut away your desires to sin, your desire to live after the flesh. But Jesus is not going to cut away anything you won't allow him to have. He won't forcefully cut away. See, Paul goes on to say, you are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So is baptism something spiritual and not a physical act? See, I don't believe you need to be baptized to be saved. But if you are saved, you will want to be baptized. Just like the physical circumcision identified the Jews with the covenant God made with Abraham, for a Christian, baptism identifies us with Christ. Through baptism, we show our dedication to Jesus and tell others that we've chosen to follow him. When we are baptized, we are buried with Christ. And as we go under that water, and we are raised with Christ as we come back out. So for a Christian, if you're looking to show your connection to Jesus, it isn't through circumcision, but it's through baptism. Not baptism into the Jewish faith, but baptism into Christ. But remember, we're not saved because we've been baptized. We are saved like the rest of the verse 12 says, through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. But what if you've never been baptized? Are you really saved? Yes, if you've asked Christ into your life, you are saved. That's what the Bible tells us. It talks about a spiritual baptism that every believer has. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. 
So as followers of Christ, we've all been baptized into the body of Christ. We died with him. We rose with him. And now we live in Christ as a part of his body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God now lives inside of everyone who follows the Lord, inside of everyone who believes in Christ. So I would strongly encourage you to get baptized, to tell the world what you've done, to tell them how much the Savior means to you. Verse 13 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I don't know if we can ever be told enough just how much we've been forgiven because we couldn't do it on our own. See, in the very beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve, they were told the punishment of sin was going to be death. They died spiritually that day. They hid from the Lord in the garden and blamed their failures on each other. See, whenever we sin, there's a cost. And a payment has to be made for sin. In the Old Testament, an offering was demanded, especially when the offense was against God. A female lamb, in other cases, according to the magnitude of the wrong, a ram, a goat. Before the offering was given, there was a confession by the one who committed this sin. But we were dead in our sins, overwhelmed, buried alive, unable to offer God anything that would pay the debt. Adam and Eve were told that the consequences of their sin would be death, and nothing they could have done after the fact would have erased their failures, their sin that they did. Nothing you or I can do will take away our sins. The punishment must be paid, and it was in this condition that God sent his son. He gave the payment for our sin, which was his life for ours. Psalms 103 verse 11 says, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And some of the greatest news that you could ever hear is that you are forgiven. We are alive again and free from sin. Paul goes on to say, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. See, there's a, a lot of different ideas of what this handwriting was. I gave you some ideas of what it could have been last time when I was in Colossians. What we do know is that the law demands a payment, right, for sin. And whatever this was, whether it was what we owed for all of our sins, whether it was all the laws that we've broken, it was bad. It stood between us and God. It separated us, cut us off from our only line of hope. We couldn't move this thing out of the way. It says that it stood against us. But Jesus, or God, I don't know which, took everything that was against us and nailed it to the cross that Jesus hung on. Like I said last time, on the cross, what was normally placed there was a list of the crimes the person had committed why they were being sentenced to death. This list of things that would sentence you and I to death could have been hung on that cross. And the difference between the death of Jesus and the sacrifice that was offered by the priest is that the priest's sacrifice had to be offered over and over again. As the people sinned, but the death of Jesus on the cross took care of the sin in the believer's life permanently. So, Trying to come up with a way to explain this, I don't know if I'm going to do a great job, but the pre-sacrifice was like going to court and paying for your crimes. Okay, I, I, I did it, I, I, I sinned, and so you pay for your crimes, you offer your sacrifice. But Jesus goes to court and he says, what does he owe? No, not, not just what has he done and what does he owe for now, but the whole thing, past, present, and future, what does he owe? And then he pays for the whole thing, past, present, and future sins. See, his sacrifice does not need to be repeated because the debt's paid. It's done. Having disarmed principalities in verse 15 and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. 
See, all the weapons, all the dirt the enemy had on us is now gone. Jesus has disarmed them. It's almost like he's given them plastic weapons that they can wave at us, but it does no good. See, the picture here that Paul is painting, I believe, is a picture of the triumphant king coming back from the war with all the people that he's conquered following behind as a public ridicule, humiliated, a laughingstock, because Jesus is triumphant over them. So picking it up in verse 16, kind of where I left off, it says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. See, this is an interesting verse, an interesting section of Scripture. Is there anything you can do to add to what Jesus has done for us on the cross to make yourself more acceptable to God? This is kind of what's been going through my mind lately. See, it's a terrible question to ask because there are a lot of people who may not answer yes, but they're very opinionated about what you can and cannot do. Do you pray standing up or sitting down? Do you pray with your eyes open or closed? They want to take this new way of being made right with God and mix it with the old way under the law. It says in Hebrews 9, verse 13, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurities. But just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. Now, if I had my Bible with me, which I wanted to, but I know I don't have much room here. I'd probably hold it up and I'd say, see, the first two-thirds of this book talks about that new covenant and how the people were to come to the Lord and how when they didn't, they were disciplined and God dealt with them. And then the last third is this new part, this new covenant that God's made with us. See, that new way is through simple faith in Jesus Christ. The way to be made right with God by obeying the law is done away with. Now, I believe in Jesus, but someone might say, but you also need to believe in the Ten Commandments and to do them. If you are to keep the Ten Commandments, what about the laws concerning food? And this group called the Judaizers that were the ones Paul was dealing with taught that in order for a Christian to truly be right with God, he must conform to the Mosaic law. Circumcision, like I said, was high on their list for a Christian to do in order to be saved. Gentiles had to become Jewish proselytes. And then they could come to Christ. See, the doctrine of the Judaizer was a mix of grace through Christ and works through keeping of the law. And that's addressed in Acts 15 and strongly condemned in the book of Galatians. And here in Colossians, Paul is also dealing with it. See, the reason it's such a big deal is that by trying to add works or doing something to help you earn salvation or grace in God's eyes, is saying that the finished work of the cross is not enough. There's more that a person needs to do, and that is not the case. Yes, we've been forgiven a huge debt, but there's nothing more we can do to pay that debt than to accept the grace of God who sent Christ to pay it for us. Legalism is our attempt to reach out to God to earn salvation by keeping a list of rules but Christianity is different because it is all based on Jesus Christ reaching out to us saying, I know you can't do it, but I already did it. And I did it for you. Take my perfect life on yourself, my robes of righteousness. You put them on. He did it all. Now, I'm not saying that when it comes to the Ten Commandments that they aren't good for us, but that Jesus was the only one who truly kept the law. And we come to God based on that and not based on our ability or inability to follow a list of rules. See, we're told after all that Jesus has done that we should let no one judge us in food, in drink, regarding a festival, a new moon, a Sabbath. You know, I, I like pork. Someone else may say that I'm not allowed to eat bacon. 
So what should I do? They obviously have a problem with what I'm eating. Or I need to be fasting and celebrating the Passover. What about the Jewish festivals? Passover is coming up. What if I don't celebrate it? What if I do? The new moon celebrations, the beginning of the month, that was celebrated with sacrifices to God. How do I respond to the one who is convicted by what I do? 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, let all that you do be done with love. You respond lovingly. You don't have to get in their face and tell them how they are wrong. Bring out all the Bible verses to back up your case. In fact, Paul said if they had a problem with eating meat, he would never eat meat again if it caused his brother to stumble. Respond lovingly. See, the Sabbath was a day of rest for the Jews, and they worshiped God every day, not just on Saturday, and they offered sacrifices to him. The Bible nowhere describes Christians setting aside the Sabbath day as the day of worship. There's no evidence in the New Testament that the apostles or the early Christians in any sense observed the Sabbath day as the prescribed day of worship. Now, I, I'm lingering on the Sabbath for a reason. Because I've been told that I'm worshiping the Antichrist by coming to church on Sunday. That I've taken the mark of the beast and my eternal home is not going to be one that I'm going to enjoy. See, according to this scripture, I should not let anyone judge me because I worship God on Sunday. Legalism says there are things I need to do to be acceptable to God and things I shouldn't do. Besides believing in Jesus, there's nothing I can do to be acceptable to him. We've already gone over this. I can't be made right by keeping the Sabbath, the festival days, or by what I eat or drink. Hebrews 11 says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, from the tribe of Judah, not of Levi, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. See, in Hebrews here, we're talking about another priest. We are told that if we could be made perfect through the law and the priests of Levi, then we would not need another priest. And the Bible tells us clearly that God was going to give us another priest. And Jesus is that priest. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, The Lord is sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm not trying to explain who this Melchizedek is. That's not where I'm going with this. But what I do find interesting is that when we read through the Old Testament to see how through the law the Jews tried to be holy before God, they were never able to keep the law. Then we have the New Testament or the New Covenant, a new way to be made right with God, and it has nothing to do with the law. It's all about faith. Now when God gave the law to Moses, he also made the tribe of Levi the priests of God, and they upheld his laws. And from that time until today, if you are a priest, you were to be a Levite. So how can Jesus be a priest if he's from the tribe of Judah? Well, that is where this other priest comes in. Melchizedek. See, Jesus is not a priest after Aaron and the Levites. We have a new way of being made right with God, and that is through faith in Christ. Well, if we have a new way to be made right with God, a new covenant, then we also need a new priest to be over that new way. Now, Hebrews seven fifteen through 22 goes on and it says, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has not, according to the law of, who has not come, who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
Now, this Melchizedek, he has no beginning recorded in the Bible of when he was born, and nothing's recorded of when he died. He was a priestly line that never ended. Now, Christ is a priest, not under Aaron, but like Melchizedek, forever. For on the one hand, there is an annoying of the former com commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, an annulment. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. See, the covenant gave God, God gave to Moses with the law made nothing perfect. It couldn't. It only pointed out how far short we fall. It causes us to cry out, I can't do it. I need help. It says, and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he was an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And in Hebrews 7.28, it says, For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. We have a greater priest, a forever priest, not one that needs to continually offer sacrifices, but one who's done it forever. He mediates. He is that priest. He is the surety. See, this is one of those things I, I, I never put together before. See, I know that Jesus is the way God wants us to come to him. There is a new promise between God and us, but I never realized that both the old way and the new way each had to have a priest. And you can't have one without the other. Well, that's, maybe you guys have been there before me. You, you picked up on that pretty quick, but... Uh, the part that was interesting to me is if you are still choosing to follow the law, you are also choosing to be under a different priest than Christ. And I thought, that's interesting. The law made nothing perfect. And when the early church was constantly told they needed to follow the law, Paul would argue against it. So the early church, they sent Paul and Barnabas back to the disciples to bring an end to this discussion about following the law. And you can find the story, like I said, in Acts chapter 15. See, Paul asked them what they should do. And when he did, it caused another dispute, another argument. The outcome was that Peter, James, and the other apostles all agreed that they were unable to keep the law, and they were not going to place that burden of following the law on the new believers. How freeing is that? What rejoicing they had when they realized that what Jesus offers us is truly free. It's a free gift. See, you've been rescued from all of these rules, and we're not trying to give you a bunch of rules today. I'm not giving you a list to follow. It's simple. It's simple faith in Jesus Christ. So why do you want to make yourselves slaves again to the law all over again? Why do you want to go back to Jewish legalism and abandon Christian freedom So a question, do you have to follow the law? No, and yet the question still causes arguments today. You know, being a Christian is really simple. You need to believe in Christ, and if you will live your life to please him, you will be like that tree planted by the rivers of water that bears fruit in its season. Its leaf will never wither. Better yet, you'll be like that branch that Brad had talked about in Christ, that vine, cared for by the vine dresser. See, Paul has more to say about the law, the feast days, circumcision, and the Sabbath. He says they're shadows. They're shadows of things to come. But the substance, the meat, is of Christ. That law was only a shadow of the truth, but the real truth is in Christ. That is to say, if you base your relationship with God on eating and drinking certain kinds of food and drinking and abstaining from others, what you have is a religion, a religion which is founded on 
Sabbath observances, the law, but it's only a shadow of what God has given us. That is a way that we can have fellowship with him through Christ. We can have a relationship, not a religion, with the Son of God. And under the law, they had the shadow of things to come, but in Christ is the substance. J. Vernon McGee wrote this, uh, I didn't quote it verbatim, but uh, he had a great way of explaining this. He said, it would be like carrying around a picture in your pocket. And he said that this lady had a picture of her husband. I don't know if he went away to a war or whatever. And she carried this picture around with her. And then she would show it to people. But when her fiancé or her husband came back, she didn't pull out the picture out of her pocket and start kissing the picture because it would be just a shadow. The law was just a shadow, but the real thing, the substance of this whole Bible is Christ. It says, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. See, we are in the vine. Let no one cheat you and make you think that you are not in the vine. We are in Christ. And if anyone tells you that you are not because you don't follow the law, you don't follow the lists, don't let them because it will rob you of the joy we have in the finished work of Christ. It really is that easy. Simple faith. There's nothing more to add. Nothing you could do. In fact, those who try to follow the law have a humility that point, Paul points out is false. They are all puffed up in pride because they feel like, because of their obedience to the law, they have pleased God. Nothing we do could make God more pleased than he already is because we believe in his Son. It says in verse 19, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Again, Paul warns the believers that they need to be on guard, so no one will be able to cheat them out of their reward. Four times in this chapter alone, Paul gives a warning about letting someone cheat you, deceive you, judge you. This is because there are people who want to tell us that there's more that we need to know. There's a new understanding of Jesus Christ that will really change the way you think. But the truth is, we really need to know what the Word of God says so that when someone tells us something like this, we won't be deceived. New religions have started up because of a new way that they understand the Word of God, because of a new thing that they found. See, pride is what I feel when I keep my list. You know, if I have my Bible reading list and I read it every day and I pray like I intend to and I, I mark it off my list, that feeling that I have of God's approval is pride. It, it doesn't have a place in the body of Christ. Pride causes us to let go of Christ and put ourselves in charge. Paul is warning against that. You are being cheated. You have a false sense of humility. And you know what I feel when I don't do that? Shame. I let God down. I didn't do what I was supposed to. No, I read the word because I want to know the Lord. I pray because I care about the people. Because I'm concerned. It's not because I have to. Instead, continue to place your hope in Christ and only Him. God will do the rest. We will grow. That fruit is produced in our lives as we remain in the vine. See, the head is Christ. The head of the branch is the vine. God has given us the greatest gift. And for us to say, that's not good enough. I would rather earn my own way by keeping the law is saying, I don't want the gift. I don't want your way. I want to go under this other priest. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? See, if you have accepted Christ and the gift of salvation that he offers, then the book of Colossians is warning us 
not to go back to the law, to be justified before God. Don't go back to it. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. You know, that circumcision we were talking about in the beginning kind of has gone with us the whole time was a, a cutting away, a cutting away. You know, our hearts are to be circumcised. We cut away that flesh. We want we to get rid of that sinful part of our lives, and it's only through Christ that we're able to have victory because when we try to do it on our own, it, it, it doesn't benefit us. We're unable to. We fail. But when we do it through Christ's help, when he gives us the power to do it, then we're successful. We're able to do that. He circumcises our heart. He cleanses us. He makes us acceptable before God. You know, when the Lord looks at me and he sees those robes that Christ has placed on me, even though I don't deserve them, he sees me as being perfect in Christ. And I can only imagine what he saw Christ looking like when he took on my sins, when he took on my robes that I had dirtied up, when he put them on himself and died that death for me. See, the Christian walk is not a list of things I do or a list of things I don't. Paul says, don't place yourself under bondage. If you are here today and you believe in Jesus, then you are no longer bound by the law. We have died with Christ. Our life of sin was nailed to the cross and we died in him, not physically, but our spiritual old life that was failing. Now we are alive, raised to life, found in Jesus. So don't subject yourself to a bunch of regulations, rules. We read here that these things look like they would be good for us, but there's no value in it. If you walk away from church today with nothing else, know this, Jesus has done it all because he loved you. And a Christian can do nothing to add to this huge gift that God is offering us. Salvation, eternal life, a relationship with God, they were all given to us free of charge. And all you have to do is believe. So live to please the Lord if you already do believe in him. Let the things you do bring him glory. I don't just say thank you to this wonderful news and go back to my old life. I live a new life, putting God first, living to please him, not because I have to, but because I am overwhelmed by what it cost and that he would pay that cost for me. You know, repentance is when I see what he's done and I'm uh, sad's not the right word, disappointed in the way I've behaved or the things that I've done, and I ask him for forgiveness. See, repentance, the judicial part, the part that uh, I wrecked it and I can't pay for it, Christ has already paid, and I thank him for that. But now that he's already paid the damage that I couldn't do, I restore that relationship with him by saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You know, if I was trying to share with uh, someone the other night, if I damage a car and I can't pay for it, and the owner says, I'll fix it, and he pays for it, the car's, the car's new again, it's all taken care of, like it never happened, great, but the owner of that car and me have a problem. The damage is done, it's taken care of, but that relationship is still damaged. And so now that we believe in Christ, we've accepted him as our Lord. That's what repentance does. It restores that relationship. It says, I'm sorry for what I've done. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for the book of Colossians, Lord. I know there's so much more in here, Lord, and, and you want to continue to teach us through your word, Father. I pray that you continue to give us understanding, Lord. Uh, correct those areas, Father, that we uh, maybe don't quite understand, Lord. Help us to be like those Bereans, to dig in, to seek out, to see if what I've said is true, Lord. If this is not, Father, uh, just I pray that you go before us, Father. Help us to dig in and find out what the truth is, Lord. We don't want to just take this for face value, Lord. Lord, we want to know your heart and how you truly feel, Father. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today, Lord, that you would do that work in their lives, Father. If there is anyone here that hasn't accepted you, Father, I pray, Lord, that you give them boldness. Boldness right now, Lord, as our heads are down, our eyes are closed, Father, that they would just, just reach up their hand, stick it up high so that they could say, I want you, and we can pray for them. I don't want to embarrass them by coming, having them come down in front and making a spectacle of them. But if there is anyone here today that would like to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, would you just lift up your hand? If there's anyone here today and they're just overwhelmed by what the Lord has done, but they see some areas that they haven't dealt with, they haven't asked for repentance, they haven't done that work, would you lift up your hand? I want to pray for you guys. Just raise up your hand. Thank you there. 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 Thank you back there. Thank you over there. Thank you over there. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, these, uh, these ones who are willing to just say, I haven't lived the life I wanted to. I've made some mistakes. Would you just forgive them, Lord? Would you help them to have that confidence that you have forgiven them? You've done it. The debt has been paid, but the relationship with you has been restored as well. That there is no more elephant in the room. There's no more distance. There's nothing standing between you and them that they are forgiven, that they are right before you. Father, just go before us today, Lord. Help us to continue to put you first in our lives, Lord. We want more of you. We want this close relationship, Father. Do that work that only you can do in us, Father. And I thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.